ourselves of HPV. Um, but what we do is probably suppress that HPV. So certainly those individuals who may develop some type of an immunity issue, so they become immunocompromised um, or other types of, of problems, that HPV can come back and become detectable. Um, in regard to risk factors for the development of cervical cancer, in addition to persistence of HPV, certainly we know that it is more likely to occur in someone who has not had pap smears um, for an extended period of time. Um, also, individuals who have had multiple sex partners um, are at higher risk because, as Courtney had said, you know, this is primarily um, transmitted sexually. Um, so the greater the number of sex partners an individual might have, or the greater number of partners that the individual's partner has had increases the risk for um, developing an HPV infection that can then go on to persist and cause a problem. We certainly know that smoking um, is an issue for individuals as well, and smoking causes um, persistence of HPV and makes it much more difficult to resolve these infections. Um, and um, oral contraceptives have actually been associated with a slightly higher risk. Now, I would say there are lots of benefits to oral contraceptives, and I would never counsel someone not to use them based upon that fact. But, you know, certainly we know that there is um, that association. Um, in regard to the development of cervical cancer, um, certainly um, it takes a long time. Cervical cancer and even cervical dysplasia is a very slowly progressive process. Um, pap smears themselves are not the best tool necessarily for detecting these abnormalities. And when I say that, um, I mean that the sensitivity to pick up change is not that high. So because though it takes um, a certain length of time, years to develop a problem, you get multiple opportunities to sample, and Courtney's gonna talk about this in a little bit, and thereby, even though you have a test that's not that good at picking up disease, by sampling multiple times, it improves that sensitivity. Um, once someone has developed a severe change, it can take up to 10 years um, to then go to a cervical cancer. So again, gives us a lot of time, fortunately, um, to, uh, you know, to pick up disease. Um, and kind of talking a little bit about cervical dysplasia. So what is that exactly? It's, it's really a term that we use to describe the presence of abnormal cells within a tissue. And as Dr. Warshall mentioned, this can often precede the formation of a cancer. Uh, so you may have seen it that way. In the past, you know, the pap smears can be recorded as many different um, things. I don't know if... Maybe. Yeah, if everyone could mute their, uh, their computers or their phones, that would be great. Go ahead, Courtney. Um, sure. So, you know, we report this as kind of mild dysplasia or moderate to severe dysplasia, as well as uh, terms called carcinoma in situ, um, which represent the most advanced pre-malignant change. Um, it's important to note that the skin must be broken for the virus to penetrate. And the reason I'm saying that is because a lot of people will wonder about how can I get this virus if it's not through sexual contact. Um, and definitely, you know, touching a surface or sitting on a surface is not going to enable you to, um, to, to get that virus. Um, you know, thinking about it as a, as a stone wall example, so you have to, for your skin, you have multiple layers of skin. Um, and if you're kind of comparing this to different levels of dysplasia, you know, the superficial layer of your skin at the top layer, you know, as you, as you start to have abnormalities or breaks in that surface, that's when you're having a mild dysplasia. Um, as you get deeper into the skin and more of those layers of skin tissue are damaged, that's when you start to develop, you know, moderate to severe dysplasia. And eventually, you know, thinking of that, of, of an actual stone wall, you know, kind of going through deep into the ground or breaking through those skin layers full thickness, that's when you have a problem and can develop an actual cancer. 
Um, now, you know, as Dr. Warshall said, once you have a high grade dysplasia, it can take, you know, a very long time to actually progress to a cancer. Um, and there are multiple opportunities along the way where we can try to stop this um, and prevent it from happening altogether. In the United States, um, it's estimated that there will be about 13,000 new cases of cervical cancer. Um, again, not a particularly high number, not when we look at the incidence of breast cancer, um, the incidence of lung cancer, colon cancer. And actually, it's um, not, it doesn't even crack the top 10 um, in terms of um, cancers affecting women. Um, and fortunately, we're seeing um, just on the order of about 4,000 um, deaths. So again, relatively low. Um, however, worldwide, it remains a very significant problem. And in underdeveloped countries, it's still, again, the number one or the number two killer um, of women. So it still becomes a huge, huge problem as you look outside of the United States, you look towards Africa, um, and other areas that may not have the opportunity to do pap smear screening the way we have. Um, however, even though we don't see a large number of cervical cancers, you know, the cancer is really just the tip of the iceberg, if you will. We know that in regard to the high grade changes that Courtney was just talking about. So again, if we think about that stone wall in the forest and, you know, everybody has kind of walked in the forest, seen those stone walls with the flat, you know, sort of stones and how they are layered one on top of the other. So when you start to get like full thickness abnormality um, of those stones representing again, full thickness changes in the skin, um, that's a high grade change. And, um, you know, probably there are hundreds of thousands of women in the United States um, with high grade changes and multiply that by a factor of three to get the number of women who have low grade changes, so just the mild change, and also genital warts. Um, so it's really a huge, huge problem, um, even though, you know, the cancer numbers, when we compare it again to breast, lung, that type of thing, um, is not that high. And given all of this dysplasia or, you know, high grade, low grade changes, condyloma, things of that nature, creates a huge amount of morbidity for our patients. So again, this is something that even when it doesn't develop into a cancer is really a very significant and in some cases can be life affecting um, event. And kind of moving into screening, because I think a lot of people are curious, what's the right thing to do? How often should I get screened? Um, there are two screening tests that are utilized, uh, typically in conjunction, which I'll talk about those intervals shortly, um, used to help prevent or identify early cervical abnormalities. So as a lot of you have heard of the pap test, um, this is looking at cytology, which that means looking for abnormal cell changes on the cervix which may progress to cancer if left untreated. Um, we also, you know, look at the HPV status as we've been discussing and identifying if there is a presence of any of those uh, high risk subtypes. As Dr. Warshall mentioned, there are lower grade or lower risk subtypes which can cause genital warts. With regards to, you know, concern for cervical cancer, we are testing the high risk subtypes. Um, and looking at screening guidelines particularly. So pap testing is uh, begins at the age of 21 um, and up until the age of 29 is really tested only every three years. At this point, HPV testing is not recommended. And that goes back to the situation that HPV is very transient, especially in the younger age generation. Um, our immune systems at that point are typically able to clear the virus. Um, so, you know, there are some exceptions for women that are immunocompromised or have exposure to HIV. Those are different, those are different situations. But from the age of 21 to 29, um, it's solely pap cytology testing. Um, as we progress to age 30 to 65, um, there are a few options. However, the preferred uh, method of testing is utilizing both the pap test with the HPV test. Now, you may have heard um, as this term referred to as co-testing, um, and this can be done every five years, and that's the recommendation. 
Um, the pap test alone, um, if you know things are normal and there's no abnormalities, that can be done every three years as well. Um, you know, when women reach a certain age, they're questioning, do I still need to get pap smears? Do I still need to go to my gynecologist? Well, yes, you still need to see your gynecologist, but with regards to PAPs after the age of 65, um, there are typically situations where you may discontinue screening. Um, if you've had three negative PAPs in a row or two negative co-testing, now that's the HPV and the PAP in conjunction, um, results in a row within the past 10 years, but with the most recent test performed within the past five years. So that can get a little confusing. Um, you also cannot have a history of cervical dysplasia. Um, if you've had a hysterectomy for whatever reason and had no history of dysplasia, you may also discontinue at that time or 20 years following surgery if there is a history of dysplasia. Um, there are circumstances when you are going to have an abnormality with the pap test, and we won't talk too much about this today, but um, typically additional testing may be indicated if abnormal screening is identified. Um, this is utilized with something called a colposcope, and that is uh, a fancy term that's used for a magnified instrument, um, a microscope to closely examine your cervix as well as the vagina and vulva for any signs of abnormal or dysplastic cells. This is all done in the office, no need for anesthesia, and very low risk of complications following the actual procedure itself. Um, at some, on some occasions, a biopsy might be performed at the same time. If there is an abnormality noted, um, we do put some vinegar on the cervix to help us highlight any abnormal looking regions of the cervix. Now, results of this colposcopy will help determine whether further testing or treatment is needed as opposed to close monitoring. And I want to reiterate here, you know, many, many women have abnormal testing. This does not mean cancer. Um, as Dr. Warshall men mentioned, many abnormal changes do go back to normal on their own. So even though at this point we've been focusing mostly on the cervix, there are um, a number of other um, organs that are also affected by HPV-associated disease. And from a gynecologic perspective, we certainly recognize that vaginal cancers are HPV-related, vulvar cancers. So you can see how the entire genital tract can be affected. Um, anal cancers um, in both men and women, and certainly penile cancers um, are associated with HPV as well. And one of the things that we became aware of probably at this point, maybe about 10, 15 years ago, was that many oropharyngeal um, cancers um, are also related to HPV, primarily HPV-16, which is one of the bad actors. Um, and it's kind of interesting in that the mix of all oral pharyngeal cancers um, weigh much more on men than women. So um, men develop probably about four times as many of these oral pharyngeal cancers as women do. Um, so essentially, a study was done in 2015 that looked at the number of HPV-associated cancers and then looked at those, well, I'm sorry, the number of cancers from these various organ systems that I just mentioned, and looked to see how many of those were attributable to HPV. And they found that about 31,000 were attributable to HPV, so well over um, the number of cervical cancers alone. And this sort of segues then into what I think represents really the paradigm shift that we are currently involved in, and that's the HPV vaccine. Um, and I'm going to talk about the HPV vaccine in a bit of detail because I think it's very important, but this particular study estimated that of those 31,000 or so HPV-associated cancers, um, if everyone had had the HPV vaccine, we could have prevented over 29,000 of them. So a huge, huge impact on these cancers. And I think people don't really understand the gravity of that. This is really the opportunity to not just diagnose cancer at an early stage, um, not diagnose precancers as Papanicolaou did, 
but really prevent the root cause of many of these cancers. Um, so this vaccine um, is a very, very powerful mechanism to really eliminate cancer. Um, so in the United States, originally developed, it was in the early 2000s, there were two vaccines. One was called Cervarex, which vaccinated against two high-risk HPV subtypes, HPV 16 and 18. And they're thought to be the two sort of worst actors, if you will, of the high-risk subtypes. And we estimate that 70% or so of severe changes on the cervix that are precancerous, and about 70% of cervical cancers will be associated with either HPV 16 or 18. Um, the second vaccine that was developed back then was Gardasil. Um, Gardasil at that point was what's called a quadrivalent vaccine. So it had four components rather than the two of Cervarex. So it vaccinated against HPV 16 and 18. Um, and it also vaccinated against HPV subtype 6 and 11. And they were associated with about 90% of condyloma or genital warts. And studies showed that both of them were very effective. Um, for one reason or another, and I'm not going to go into it, but Cervarex um, sort of lost its approval um, in the United States. It is, however, used widely internationally. Um, and more recently, Gardasil, which started out as, again, a quadrivalent vaccine, meaning that there were four different subtypes of HPV that it protected against, um, developed into a nine-valent um, vaccine. So it picked up five additional high-risk subtypes. So essentially, at this point, the thought is that um, Gardasil 9 will protect against 90% of the HPV subtypes that can cause high-grade changes on the cervix that are precancerous and about 90% of cervical cancers. Um, it is now um, approved in the United States for the prevention of cervical cancer, vaginal, vulvar, anal, and within the last couple of weeks was approved for the prevention of head and neck cancers. So major, major change. Um, in addition, um, studies have indicated that as of this year or next year, actually there will be more men affected by HPV-related cancers than women, because in the past we had always just associated with cervical cancer. Um, so these are huge changes. Um, in regard to the vaccine itself, the vaccine is composed of what are called capsid proteins. So essentially, the HPV is sort of covered by this protein coat. And what they've done is they've reproduced these protein coats, and they have developed um, the vaccine based on the coat. Now, when a person receives the vaccine, um, they are not getting any active virus. They're not getting any DNA from the virus. There is no way that you can develop an HPV infection from receiving the vaccination. So again, I think that that's very important for people to understand. Um, so it's very low risk in that regard. Um, in addition, this is a prophylactic vaccine. So by that, I mean to be effective, um, it needs to be given prior to the individual coming in contact with the HPV subtypes that are included in the vaccine. So again, we had talked a little bit about HPV 6, HPV 11, 16, 18. So again, for Gardasil to be really effective, you want to vaccinate someone before they have come in contact with these HPV subtypes. Um, so the recommendation has been for a long time that we begin to vaccinate between 11 and 13. Um, and that's thought to be the ideal time. It's a little bit before individuals um, start to become sexually active. Um, we know from studies that when we look at 13-year-olds, for instance, 5% are actually sexually active um, across the country. A little bit shocking, I think, but that is what the statistics show. So certainly we want to get to those individuals before that happens. 
Um, so that's very, very important. The other thing that's interesting is that when you vaccinate at a younger age, you have a more vigorous immune response. Um, so the current recommendation, well, let me take a step back. The classic way to have given Gardasil um, was a three shot series. So you would start out with the first shot. Two months later, you would get the second shot. Then six months later, you would get a third shot. Because of that enhanced immune response in younger individuals, the recommendations are now that if you begin below the age of 15, you only need two shots and you get the first shot, and then the second shot is given anywhere from six to 12 months later. Um, and it's shown equal efficacy to the three shot series. So there's a real benefit or multiple real benefits um, to getting started early. Um, when Gardasil was initially approved, it was approved from the ages of nine to 26, initially just for women. Um, and then boys and men were included. And now the indication actually goes out to the age of 45. Um, but there's a little caveat for those who are, you know, vaccinated between or considering vaccination between the ages of 27 and 45. And that's that, you know, it should be done in consultation with your physician. Um, it may not be appropriate for everyone. It depends upon, you know, each individual circumstance. So that's something that should be discussed with the individual physician. So, Courtney? Yeah, um, so also just to kind of piggyback on that too, I wanted to highlight, you know, one of the success stories of vaccination, um, looking at Australia in particular. Um, so they're, they're kind of on the, the way to almost eradicating cervical cancer altogether. Um, almost all Australian schools have chosen to participate in what's called the National HPV Vaccination Program. Um, over 9 million doses of the vaccine have been given to, to girls and young women in Australia. Um, and research studies have shown very early signs of the vaccine success, um, including a 77% reduction in HPV types that are responsible for approximately 75% of cervical cancer. Um, they've also noted almost 50% reduction in the incidence of high-grade cervical abnormalities in girls under the age of 18, as well as a 90% reduction in genital warts in heterosexual men and women under 21 years of age. So I think that this is definitely a model that we should really look up to and say, you know, wow, they're, they're doing phenomenally, um, and it's, it's impressive. Um, also, you know, a question that comes out a lot is, you know, are, is the HPV vaccination safe? Um, no serious side effects have been shown to be caused by the vaccine whatsoever. Um, most common problems are brief soreness and local symptoms at the injection site, but this is very similar to other vaccines. Um, and as Dr. Warshall mentioned, it is safe in regards to you cannot contract HPV, HPV from the vaccine because of these capsid proteins that um, it's comprised of. Um, and with regards to, you know, is this, is this efficacious? Um, trials have found that Gardasil 9 uh, has been nearly 100% effective in preventing cervical, vulvar, and vaginal disease that's caused by five additional high-risk HPV subtypes. So I would say it's definitely very efficacious. So we're, we're currently at the point where well over 300 million injections have been given worldwide. And as Courtney had said, there has not been a single study um, that has indicated any um, significant adverse events associated with the vaccine itself. So I think that that's very important to understand. I think that as Courtney had said, the efficacy is excellent. So that comes, that brings us to Probably the biggest question that I have with something that is so safe, so effective, um, can benefit boys and girls, why is it that we're not vaccinating nearly as many individuals as we should be? Um, so CDC um, estimates from 2017 show that in regard to the general vaccinations that kids get from their pediatrician, so Tdap, meningitis, things of that nature. Um, nationally, the rate is in the high 80s generally. Um, in New Jersey, it's actually in the low 90s. So we're doing pretty well. However, for HPV, 
um, for completion of the vaccination, we are actually right around the 50% mark. So we are really lagging behind. Um, and it's not entirely clear why that is. I think that you know you do have um, those that are concerned about side effects. You've got anti-vaxxers who um, at times will um, bring up um, studies that have been debunked, things of that nature about autism and vaccines in general. None of that has been shown to be true. Um, we here at Cooper have been working with MD Anderson in Houston. We've been working with the state of New Jersey. We've been working with the American Cancer Society to try to develop strategies to improve um, these numbers. Um, certainly, we all understand that a lot of this lies in the laps of the pediatrician. And studies have shown that really it's the recommendations of the pediatricians and at times the obstetrician gynecologist that hold the most weight with um, families. And when you get a strong recommendation from a clinician um, in regard to vaccination, it really boosts the rate up. In addition, what we've tried to do is um, throughout, for instance, a pediatrics office, we've tried to educate um, each person who meets a patient along the way. So it starts out at the front desk, the receptionist, the MA, nurses, and again, obviously the clinician, to all be familiar with the recommendations for vaccinating HPV, um, to understand the benefits, and to be as encouraging as possible for young patients and their parents. Um, so, in conclusion, you know, certainly, you know, I want everyone to understand how ubiquitous HPV is. It's it's everywhere. Um, it doesn't necessarily take penetrative um, intercourse to spread. Um, certainly, there are some new methods for screening um, for cervical dysplasia, cervical cancer. In addition to just the cytology, we're testing for HPV. That's been very helpful. But the real paradigm shift is the vaccine. Um, and again, we've got a vaccine available to us that is extremely safe, um, extremely efficacious, and at least to my mind, um, there is no reason not to use. And although I can't flash it up right now, I would show you if I had it. Uh, I don't know how to take over the screen, but I would show you a picture of my two kids. And both of my two kids, Ellie is 19, Max is 20. Um, both of them were vaccinated at the age of uh, ages of 11 and 12. Um, so again, I think you need to put your money where your mouth is. And, um, you know, those are my two kids. So do we have any questions? So I see one comment, and I appreciate the uh, the support. Um, any questions? And I guess you can unmute your mics if you'd like as well. That would be fine also. I do have a question I see. Um, all right, so we're getting a couple of questions. Let's let's address them. after Right, so are there any negative? Yeah, if we can mute the microphones for a moment. If everyone can mute. So <laughs> Between 26 and 45. And certainly, no, there are no significant ramifications, but we don't want to use um, a vaccine that may not benefit someone. So, Courtney and I were discussing it earlier today, and I often give the example of if I have a patient who comes in um, and is, let's say, 40 and wants to know um, whether they should receive the vaccine. So if their circumstance is, if they've had maybe just a couple of sexual partners, if um, the same is true for their partner, let's say they were in a monogamous relationship, a marriage, for instance, and let's say they're getting divorced, unfortunately, 
and they're thinking about entering the dating pool at the age of 40. Under those circumstances, I think that it would be very reasonable to go ahead and get vaccinated because the likelihood that they would have had significant exposure to HPV is relatively low. However, if I'm talking with a 40-year-old who has had many relationships um, for a whole variety of reasons, um, probably under those circumstances, just the fact that they've had a fair amount of contact would make um, vaccination less beneficial to them. I can't say that it wouldn't be beneficial, but the degree of benefit is less. So under those circumstances, it becomes much more questionable as to whether there's benefit. Um, and uh, one other question that came up, and I think you had addressed this a little bit, Courtney, so you can take it, but I'll read the question. Can you briefly talk about vaginal paths after hysterectomy for benign findings? So, Courtney? Sure. Yeah. So, very good question. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, um, if you have a hysterectomy for benign reasons with no history of cervical dysplasia, you can discontinue vaginal paps as well. However, if there is a history of cervical dysplasia, these vaginal paps need to be continued for 20 years past that. So it is something that you kind of have to, you know, be honest about what your history is with regards to pap smears and what the reason for your hysterectomy is. Um, those all play a role in the decision for continuing surveillance. Great, thank you. Uh, we've got a question. Is there testing to know if someone has the malignant strains of HPV? And if so, can that be done as guidance to vaccination? So I, I think that that's a, a very good question because it drives home a point that I think that we all need to understand. And the point is that the vaccine that we're talking about is a prophylactic vaccine. It's a vaccine that has to be given before you contract the particular type of HPV. So if you're in a situation where you already have a high risk subtype, then the vaccine is not going to help you for that high risk subtype. Now, for instance, we're talking about Gardasil 9. If you happen to have HPV 16, it may help for the um, other high risk HPV subtypes that are included in the vaccine but it's not going to help you for the particular subtype that you may have detected. Um, so therefore, we don't use that as a sort of guide as to who to vaccinate, who not to vaccinate. The idea is to vaccinate everyone. And in particular, we want to hit individuals between the ages, again, of 11 and 13, before they become sexually active, before they have potentially contracted any infection, and that's where we're going to derive the greatest benefit. Um, another question just came in. For people who are older and do not have the strains as guidance for them to vaccinate or not, um, I, think I think we kind of, yeah, I think we kind of, yeah, address that. Other questions? Um, and again, you can even type, the, either type them in or um, unmute if you'd like. All right, well, if there are no other questions, um, you know, we really appreciate your, your joining us this evening. Um, from our perspective, it's a lot of fun. It's really nice to come out to speak to people about something that we are very passionate about that's, that's very important to get the word out. Um, I would suggest that you talk to your friends, relatives, you know, um, anyone who will listen um, about these issues and particular vaccination, particularly vaccination. You know, we really need to push um, locally, statewide, nationally um, to really bring our vaccination rates up. Um, and every one of us can help in that regard. So thank you for joining us and uh, have a wonderful evening.